Good morning, fellow farmers. Now, if you think that you have inadvertently stumbled into a meeting of the 4-H club, let me tell you, tell you why I've included us under the title Farmers. Jesus told this story that we know as the parable of the soils. He says, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came along and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants withered, and the birds came along, and they snatched away the seed. That soil had no root, but there was another kind of soil. And this was where the seed fell among the thorns or thorny weeds. And it grew up, and those weeds choked the plants so that they did not bear gain, grain. But then other seed fell on good soil, rich soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, and some 100 times. And so the various responses when we tell someone the good news of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, we talk to them about the bad news, we're all sinners and we need forgiveness of our sins. But God has provided what we can never furnish for ourselves. God has provided the forgiveness of sins because God is a just God and any means of salvation must fulfill every demand of God's righteousness, his justice. And so he sent his son, the Holy One, the only one qualified to be a substitute for us and pay the penalty for our sins, which is death, spiritual death, separation from God. And obviously we all experience physical death. And so he went to the cross in our place. He fully satisfied God's righteous demands that justice be fulfilled and salvation is free for everyone who trusts in Jesus. That is the marvelous message that we have to bring to others. And we would think that anyone who hears this good news, well, how could they not receive it? How could they not joyfully receive it and trust in Jesus and be forgiven of their sins? forgiven of their sins, and know that they are a child of God. They're born into his family, and they have heaven that awaits them. And yet some reject that message outright. They go on as if they've never heard it. Others seem to respond, but it doesn't last. And others when trials and temptations and persecution or the desires of this life come up, it takes them away and reveals they never did really receive the good news. But others, and this is the point, a profound encouragement for us. The, others, the other things are taught to us by Jesus. He's talking to his disciples. He's not talking to the unbelievers around. He's talking to his disciples and he says... Listen, I want you to know what to expect because often you'll be tempted to be discouraged. You'll see responses where nobody seems to be pay attention. No one seems to care. No one seems to desire the extraordinary message that you're bringing to them. He says, listen, sometimes that seed is going to find rich soil and the harvest that it's going to produce is incomprehensibly beyond any expectation that you would have. And you'll see this exponential increase of people who come to know the Lord, and they are just compelled to tell everybody they know. And their network is already unbelievers, and they'll go out and they'll share the gospel. Others will go on the streets. Others will go quietly to members of their family. And that message of the gospel is going to take root in their hearts. So be encouraged, be faithful, persevere, persevere. You don't control the soil. That's God's role. We're called to be farmers. If you don't like being called a farmer, 
getting down and, and dirtying your hands. And, and by the way, that is a most um, honorable um, uh, uh, work and the most honorable vocation to be a farmer or a gardener. And, uh, but how about ambassador? Does that sound a little more prestigious to you? Well, we're called to be ambassadors as well as farmers. It's the same thing, actually. We take the message, we represent God. And uh, Paul writes, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, as we go through this, and we're, we're spending three weeks going through this one parable. It is a foundational parable, and Jesus says, listen, if you don't understand this one, if you don't get the parable of the soils, well, you won't understand the other parables either, because this is kind of the key. It's foundational, so it's very important that we get this parable, and um, that's why we're spending a lot of time on it. One of the things to look forward to in this psalm comes up in verses 16 and 17. We're going to focus on 13 through 17 this morning. But 16 and 17 will um, tell us what happens when troubles and persecution come. And they, they have two effects. And in God's plan, the two effects are this, affliction and, and, and persecution will reveal the fake faith of pretend Christians. That'll expose it. And that those same troubles and persecutions will prove to the believer that you really do belong to God. And that is extremely encouraging, isn't it? It proves, well, I really am a child of God because I lasted through this, I endured through these troubles. And actually, my faith got stronger. And my relationship with the Lord, through the trouble times, through the persecution, is now deeper. I'm closer to Him. And I'm more assured because of the trouble times. That's one of the jewels that come out in this portion of, of that parable. So uh, keep that in mind as we work our way forward to it. Um, the, the, the simple parable... All the people who heard Jesus say this understood it. You remember the crowd was so large in, in verse 1 of, of Mark 4. <clears throat> the crowd was so large that they were in Galilee. Jesus had asked, as he commonly did, when there's a crowd, make sure there's a boat ready. So Jesus gets into a small boat, push, pushes back from the shore. And there the people, this huge crowd is on the shore the flatlands between the Sea of Galilee and the mountains, the hills beyond. And then Jesus tells this parable. They all heard the parable, and they all understood the agricultural part of it. They'd all seen seeds go on to the beaten down path. It would be an easy target for the birds. The birds would follow the farmer. And as soon as the farmer took a few steps, they would swoop down and grab the seed and fly off. They would eat it. And then... They'd seen the, the soil go into the rocky places. Now, this is not soil that has rocks, as we learned last week, that, because the farmer would remove all those visible rocks, rocks that would be hit with the plow. He would remove all that. But there was a limestone bedrock that is commonly found um, in Israel, and, and that keeps the the, the roots from going down. And Luke says there was no moisture in that shallow soil. And so those seeds produce, it springs up. And in fact, it's higher than the rest of the seed because it can't go down. It goes up and everyone, wow, this is great. We're, aren't we going to have a great crop here? But it soon is scorched by the sun because as Luke says, there's no moisture in that tiny little bit of soil. This between the top of the soil and the limestone bedrock. And um, by the way, the, the rabbis had an expression um, that when God was distributing rocks around the world, he made a mistake and dropped them all on Israel. <laughs> and so um, <coughs> farmers are hardworking people uh, in places where there is rocky soil. And 
then uh, next week we will look uh, um, at verses uh, <coughs> verses 18 and, and, and following 18 to 20. And uh, we will see that uh, there is, is uh, the, the soil that represents uh, persecution. And um, uh, that's in, in verse 17. And then uh, we see beyond that, we have the, uh, the soil that... Um, let me read it to you. <laughs> Other seed fell among thorns, and it grew up and choked the plants so that it did not bear grain. And then the final one is the good soil that multiplies 30, 60, and 100. The uh, thorny soil is, uh, and you'll remember from last week, uh, this is it's not that the, the farmer throws seed amongst visible weeds. Um, nobody would do that. And if you're on Anita's team of doing landscaping around the church, um, you don't leave the roots of weeds when you pull them up. You make sure the weeds come up, uh, the roots come up with the weed, right? But there are places where the weed pops off and the root stays in the soil. And so this is what happens here, and we'll look at this next week. But this is the, the thorny weeds that come up and choke the uh, the grain as it begins to, the seed as it produces um, growth and produces grain eventually, but the grain is choked out. But we'll look at that next week. Um, so the people who were listening to Jesus preach from that little boat, they all understood the cultural part, but they didn't understand the point of the parable. They don't understand the spiritual part because they have rejected Jesus. Only the believers will get the explanation as to what it means. And the listeners would have been particularly intrigued by what happens to the good soil. 30, 60, and 100 time yield or produce this is way beyond any normal expectation, which is seven and a half times the seed that's sown. Now, this is 30, 60, and 100 times. So they're absolutely intrigued by that surprise part of this parable. And they're wondering, what does he mean? How does this happen, this exponential growth? They never hear the explanation because they have already decided to reject Jesus. But it's only when Jesus is alone with his disciples. And by the way, um, as we mentioned last week, Jesus often has these surprise elements in his parables. For instance, the hero in the... A good Samaritan story is a Samaritan, one who was rejected uh, by the Israelites. And so this surprise is the extraordinary yield. Now, what is Jesus preparing his people for? Because he goes aside with his own, with believers, with the twelve and other disciples, others who are followers. And he, he gives the explanation to them. And so they under, they're being prepared. They don't know yet about Pentecost. They haven't seen anything like Pentecost yet. They've seen people reject the gospel. They've seen people who appear to accept it. But really what they're going after is the healings and the miracles and the free bread and fish that they get from Jesus. But Jesus is preparing them for true conversions of 3,000 on one day and 5,000, these great numbers, 30, 60, and 100 times, something unimaginable to them. But he wants them not to be discouraged by the negative responses. They're going to be tempted to think, I'm just such a terrible sore. I'm, going to, I'm getting out of the farming business. I'm, not, I'm going to stop 
telling the good news to others is just too discouraging to do. And Jesus says, persevere. Persevere. Keep on doing this. It is the greatest thing that you can do as a child of God. You have the most powerful message in the universe. It's yielded by the Son of God himself, God in human flesh, giving it to those first disciples in generation after generation after generation. Why is there a church in the year 2017? Well, soon it'll be 2017. Well, because generation after generation after generation, people have told this message. I love to tell the story. That's what we sing. That's what we believe. There's nothing greater than we can do. The greatest joy, the greatest thrill that we have is to see a life transformed by Jesus Christ. To see hope in a person. They're not afraid to die. They're not afraid of the consequences of things they've done wrong in the past. They confess those. They're forgiven. They know they're forgiven. And they're in Christ. And they have that joy. That's our great privilege. And so we, we see the different kinds of soil. We don't create the soil. Our role is to be faithful farmers and to sow the seed. We bring the message. We give out the gospel. Sometimes it will be rejected. There's hard soil. No response at all. Impenetrable hearts. And sometimes it'll be only received superficially like the limestone rock bed. The shallow soil doesn't go very deep. And then it seems to be growing, and we're all thrilled at this wonderful conversion story, but then it's, it dies in the sunshine, doesn't last, and we're discouraged. And then we see the, 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 we, the grain that comes up and is choked out by the, the thorny weeds, the desires, the richness of this world. And, and so that's the uh, discouraging as well. But... But there's something else, the good soil, the rich soil. Jesus prepares the hearts, and sometimes incomprehensibly, what we sow, and we go to bed and we forget about it, as the text tells us. Um, we forget about it, and yet we come up, and there's green popping up all over the farm. People are responding, and they're growing beyond our imagination. We, um, in, in his uh, comments on this passage, uh, John MacArthur um, says, what we often look at is, are the wrong elements of the parable. We look at the sower. Who's the sower? Well, it's us. In, in Matthew, it talks about the Son of Man. Jesus is the sower. But we participate with Jesus, and we're called to be sowers or farmers to spread the message. And so um, a lot of times people say, well, you know, the problem is the sower, if, if there are not a lot of conversions, it's our fault. So uh, maybe we need to dress differently. Either, you know, if, if I dress in an Armani suit, maybe that will impress people, or maybe people are looking for a dressing down, blue jeans and a, and a, and a T-shirt with skull and crossbones or whatever it might have, something to to say, you know, we're cool, we understand the culture, so you'll accept the message, right? The, the, the problem is, is, is not the sower. We, we are to use common sense in, um, as Paul said, becoming all things to all people, and to understand the culture, and to, to avoid unnecessary obstacles, and, and just to, to be wise about those kinds of things. But really, the, um, the focus is not on us. It's not about us. It's really about the message. And the message is perfect. And so we're not to say, you know, if we change the message and make it easier for people to believe, if we uh, <coughs> just talk about heaven... And don't talk about judgment, don't talk about God's righteous justice, then, um, you know, we, we need to bring the message in all of its power. And as Paul writes, for I am not ashamed of gospel, for it is the power of God to save. 
It is so powerful, and because we become used to the gospel, we forget how life-transforming it is. And the effect in the rich soil, the good soil, it lasts forever. So we're to be faithful in transmitting this. So we, we don't put the emphasis on, on ourselves. How do I make myself more presentable as, uh, as a sower, as a farmer? Well, we need to study the Word and be in the Word, and then we'll be, our hearts will be ready to be fit for that and to be sensitive to people who have needs around us. But it's not about how we dress or not about um, our educational um, diplomas that we may have or anything like that. That's, that doesn't make any difference. It's the message that is important. So let's not tamper with the message. The message is already perfect and it's powerful as it is in Scripture. Let's not water it down. Let's present it the way that it is lovingly, but clearly. And so the emphasis of this parable is on the soil, and that is in God's control. God prepares the heart. What is the soil? The soil is a human heart. And you you look at Scripture, and you see that the sower is pretty... Um, it, it, there's such a variety of the sower, uh, of the sower, so it's pretty irrelevant to the, the the parable. Who do you have as sowers? Well, what about a brand new believer? What about a believer with a terrible reputation? You find both of those in the woman at the well, right? Brand new believer. Now she doesn't go and say, "Listen." I'm, I've decided to become an evangelist. She goes in and she simply raises a question. And she uses her bad reputation to say, this man has told me all the terrible things I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? So she's real about her reputation. She knows what people think of her in this town. But she's pointing to Jesus. Could this be the Messiah? He's exposed all my sins that you guys already know about. How did he know? He, he knows the heart. He knows your heart. And so they go out and see Jesus. And there is a revival in that town. Unlikely evangelist. And you have uh, people like a persecutor of Christians. How could he become a, a leader of the church? And here you have Saul who becomes Paul. A persecutor. Chased down Christians, hunted them, jailed them, held the clothes of those who stoned Stephen. Unlikely evangelist. And God says, I'm going to use that man. In fact, I've chosen him. He's going to suffer many things, but he's going to be extraordinarily effective. And then you have Matthew, a former tax collector. You could go to Zacchaeus and a lot of others. You look at the Bible and you see the, the sower. Well, if you think you're not qualified, if the only qualification is, do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Well, let him use you. Take the perfect message, the seed of the gospel, and let God be the one who is concerned about preparing the heart. And so the point of, of this explanation of the parable is to encourage those believers who could become discouraged, just like you or I could, when we bring the gospel to others. And then we see the soil, that is, the hearers, those who hear the good news. And in verse 9, Jesus says this, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Can you hear the message of the gospel this morning? Do you have that capacity? And Jesus explained not everyone does because he has already presented the gospel to those who had come up from Jerusalem, those who were there to accuse him, those who were there to get evidence against him, those who heard the message as he clearly presented it to them initially, they hear the message just as clearly as, um, as Jesus is the 12 who follow Jesus. 
and others who followed him. Jesus is very open and clear about the gospel, but they come to the point where they say, Jesus, your power in doing miraculous works comes from the devil. It comes from Beelzebub. They had crossed the line. They had attributed the works of Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, to the devil. And Jesus says, you've committed something that's unforgivable. You've gone past the point of having ears that can hear and understand. And therefore, I'm going to speak in parables and not explain the meaning of the parable to you. You'll understand the agricultural part, but you won't understand why I told the parable. That I'm going to explain to those who believe in me, the disciples, the twelve, and others. And so Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Not everyone can understand the message because they will not understand the message. So if you have not made a choice to follow Jesus today, I encourage you. To do that while your heart is tender. So Jesus says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. Verse 10. When Jesus was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parable. So now, we don't know the time gap between when he leaves the crowd, when the boat comes to shore, and he goes with his twelve disciples and others who followed him, those who trusted in him, they ask for an explanation. He explains to, him, to them what the parable means. He will not, as he puts it in, in, in another place, he will not cast pearls before swine. Once people have come to the point of rejecting him and attributing the work of the Holy Spirit through Jesus to Satan, that's it. They won't get the explanations of the parables. Remember, parables have two points. To, they are to clarify and to explain and to give illustrations of the, of the kingdom of God, to make it clear to people. That is to reveal, but it's also to conceal that same message from those who will not believe, those who have come to the final point of rejecting Jesus. Verse 11 Jesus, now alone with his disciples, he told them the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, that is, to believers. But to those on the outside, those who are not believers, those who have rejected him, everything is said in parables so that, and now he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6, they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Now, um, Hendrickson in his commentary goes through and he gives an explanation, you know, varying explanations for how people understand that and a lot of the uh, commentaries who are not quite so faithful in following the, the scripture, um, they'll say, oh, well, this, uh, Jesus must mean the opposite or Mark must have gotten it wrong. Uh, the, the three, uh, M Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they must be uh, confused about what Jesus actually said. Well, why is it in three gospels? It's because this is very clearly what Jesus meant to teach us. He wanted us to understand. Um, and, and some will say, but well, Jesus is so loving and tender, how could he ever actually keep people from hearing the truth? Well, this parable explains why. Some have come to the point where they have ultimately rejected Jesus. They've heard the message, and they've decided, no, I refuse to accept this. Their hearts are hardened. They're like that path that crisscrossed the fields in Israel where there were farms. They didn't have um, the fences or walls. They just had the, the boundaries would be paths, and they would be maybe three feet wide, and people would walk on them, and they would be packed down the soil would become impenetrable and when the farmer would be close to the paths and some seeds would fall there well, the birds would follow. They'd swoop down and, and get the seeds. But they were impenetrable hearts as Hendrickson writes. And so 
these were, were people who refused to see. And so Jesus, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 6. And they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, ever hearing but never understanding. Their ears work, but their heart doesn't. Never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. But they've gone past that point where they can believe. And the reason is because they won't believe. Jesus says, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And so Jesus knows his disciples need an explanation. And so he's going to explain this to them. And... Um, so he says, this is about the mystery, the secret of the kingdom of God. It's given to you, that understanding. The parable is also about judgment. Judgment of those who refuse to accept the good news and their hearts become increasingly calloused. And so in Isaiah 6, verse 9, yeah, they, they can... They can see, but they can't understand. They can hear, but it, it goes beyond their capacity to comprehend what Jesus is saying. They've gone too far, and God has shut the door. And so now Jesus speaks more and more frequently in parables to conceal the truth for those who refuse to accept him, and but then to explain it to his disciples. You remember... When Noah got into the ark and the rain came down and the people who had heard Noah witnessing to them for decade after decade after decade, who shuts the door? God shuts the door. That's a judgment. Clearly in the case of Noah, it was judgment. Jesus is talking about judgment. And this parable speaks about judgment the same judgment that Isaiah talks about. And in, in chapters 5 and 6 of Isaiah, you remember uh, uh, Isaiah is talking about the coming judgment of the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. They will happen not long, not too long after Isaiah's life. And, and so it's, it's very appropriate that Jesus quotes from Isaiah the coming judgment. In that case, it was the Babylonians but there is a judgment coming for Israel as well. That would happen in 70 A.D. with the fall of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem. There is a judgment also in <coughs> Psalm 78. We read, and, and this, uh, Stan, you're probably the only one here who remembers Psalm 78 that was a call to worship last week. But <coughs> this is a maskil of Asaph. Um, listen, O my people, to my instruction. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. So this is an Old Testament parable. Parables uh, were also to reveal and to conceal, to talk about judgment. And so here is the, um, the positive part of the parable that were for believers. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known. Our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from our children, but tell them to, generation to, gen to generations to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. Obviously, that is something that we need to transmit, the praises of the Lord. We need to tra trans. Transmit that to our children and to our grandchildren. But he goes on in that uh, Psalm 78 um, about a parable, this uh, hidden saying, about judgment. In verse 19, we read, And they spoke against God. And then in verse 21, Therefore the Lord heard and was full of wrath, and a fire was kindled against Jacob, against Israel. And so... You have this, um, this, this judgment that's coming in Old Testament parables and in New Testament parables. And um, so we see this, uh, this judgment. And you see it uh, when Nathan tells this parable, this story to David. You remember the one after David's sin with Bathsheba and, 
um, having her husband Uriah killed as the army drew back and left him exposed at the wall. Nathan comes in and he tells David a story uh, about a man who had one sheep living next door to a rich man who had lots of sheep and the rich neighbor takes the sheep of the poor man. And uh, David gets very angry about that as a shepherd and as a king. And uh, Nathan says to David, you are the man because you've taken Bathsheba from a man who was loyal to you, a poor man, and you're the king. And, and David was brought to conviction by that parable in the Old Testament. So you see judgment there. There are going to be consequences for David's act. And in um, Isaiah chapters 5 and 6, and it's from chapter 6 that he quotes here in this parable, um, we see that it is a preparation for the judgment of the fall of Jerusalem. These people, some of them would still be alive in 70 A.D. when Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Roman Empire. And so when Jesus begins to tell parables, it, uh, it's a turning point. It signals judgment for those who reject him. But he always explains the parables to encourage and to teach those who loved him. And uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 5, you see this parable about the vineyard. In Isaiah 5, 4, what more was there to do from my vineyard that I have not done in it? Here's God, the tender-hearted farmer, preparing this vineyard and he's taking care of it puts a hedge around it he says why when I, why when i expected it to produce good grapes did it produce worthless ones so now let me tell you what i'm going to do to my vineyard i'll remove its hedge and it will be consumed clearly judgment and then that's chapter five chapter six we see um, so that they may hear but not understand that's a judgment so Jesus speaks to them in hidden meanings, in parables. And so for the disciples, including us, we ask the same question that the disciples asked. Why are so few people being saved? They had gone out, and you remember uh, the solution that James and John offered. Well, they rejected the message. Let's call down <laughs> Thunder and, <laughs> and lightning on them. Wouldn't that be the right thing to do? And Jesus says, no, 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 you, don't really, you haven't really grasped the concept of evangelism yet. <laughs> and so why are so few being saved, Jesus? Jesus says, be encouraged. A day is coming. When the yield is going to be 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold, I have to die first. I have to lay down my life. So there is a means upon which God can base his forgiveness of people. His perfect death on the cross. But there is a time coming at Pentecost when you will not believe the yield 30, 60, 100 times. Completely out of proportion to what you would expect to your simply sowing the message. There is a power at work beyond anything we can imagine. As Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for those who believe. To the Greek first and to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Verse 13. Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then can you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. So clearly the meaning of the seed is the word of God, the message of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. I thought about wearing coveralls this morning, but decided not to go with that. But we, <laughs> it's not about the wardrobe of the sower. And, uh, but, but we're all farmers in that sense, and our... Uh, our role is to literally, in the Greek, throw the seed and um, to scatter, to spread the knowledge of the Word of God, the Gospel. And 
Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 2, we read, we read, The word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a word from men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. And so the power is in the word of God. It's not in the ability of the sower to convince. Paul says it's, it's not by... Uh, clever arguments that we persuade men. It's the word of God, the simplicity of the word that changes hearts and lives. And so the emphasis of the parable is on the soil. And it's not us, it's God who prepares those hearts. Our role is simply to spread the message. And Matthew chapter 13 verse 19 says, When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, that is Satan, comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. And this is the one that is on the path, the, the hardened path in the parable that Jesus teaches. Um, it has been sown in his heart. That is the soil, the good soil, as Matthew says. And so... Um, it, the message of the gospel enters the heart, it enters the mind, and it begins to take root when God prepares the heart and prepares the mind of the hearer. So the fundamental truth of this parable is that gospel proclamation by you or me or anyone who knows the gospel is not dependent upon us. The seed is already perfect. We're not to change the message. It's dependent upon the soil, the hearer, and it's God's work to prepare the heart of the hearer. Only God can prepare the heart. We simply transmit the message. You remember in John 6, this is the, 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 the part of John where a lot of people were turning away. A lot of the, those who had been following Jesus were turning away from him. And, uh, and Jesus says in that same chapter, no one comes unto me except that the Father draws him. The Father draws him. In 665, for this reason I said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him from the Father. The Father prepares the heart. He prepares the soil. You know, the farmer can't make it rain. He can till the soil he can pull weeds. He can do all kinds of things. He can't make it rain. There are certain things out of his control. That's God's work. And so God does his unexpected exponential increase of the produce. We read in 1 Corinthians 3 and so I'm reading something from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Paul says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God causes the growth. Doesn't that take the pressure off? It takes the pressure off us when we share the message. God does the work. We can't do that. But we are called to be ambassadors and farmers, faithfully transmitting the message. God causes the growth, so then neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything... It's not about us. But God who causes the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, but each one will receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you Corinthians are a letter of Christ Cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. This is the soil, the human heart. Such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God. Are you shy about sharing the gospel? Are you intimidated? Are you discouraged because people don't immediately accept it? This is encouraging to us. 
We're not adequate in ourselves. Who said that? The Apostle Paul. Was he bold in his witness? Absolutely. But he understood. It's God who does the work. We are not adequate in ourselves to consider anything is coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. So our role is to transmit the good news. We expect there to be rejection of the message. We expect people to maybe insult us or laugh at us. That's all right. That's all right. We're sharing the truth. We also expect there to be fertile hearts. And when that happens, what joy, what joy there is to see a life transformed. And so there were the hard-hearted ones, like the, the seed that fell along the trodden down path. And you see the leaders of Israel who had rejected Jesus and even attributed his miraculous works to having come from the power of Satan. And, and so we, we, we see that hardened soil, and then we see the rocky soil that had very shallow, uh, a shallow little level of soil. And then un, underneath that, you have the limestone bedrock. And so our question is, what's your heart like? What is your heart like? Are you tender to the, to the word? Um, when uh, my wife and I were uh, living up in Terban, which means good earth, <laughs> well, it was really pretty rocky where we lived, where we lived, and we had to remove a lot of rocks. And so we were looking for some topsoil, and we went to an Italian nursery, and uh, this uh, um, the fellow who, who owned it uh, explained to us. He, he asked us to put our hands down in the soil, and he said, Freshy moisty, freshy moisty. <laughs> this is good soil. It was dark and rich. And so that's what we used, and it, and it worked. What's your heart like? Is, is it ready to receive the word of God? Verse 16 Others like seeds sown on were like seeds sown on rocky places, and they hear the word of God, and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. And two things: when trouble, and in the Greek it's thlipsis, adversity, troubles, affliction come, or persecution comes. Because of the word. Because of the word. Somebody intimidates them because they've heard the word. Maybe they've told somebody, I've decided to follow Jesus. And people laugh at them. Mock them. So afflictions, persecution because of the word. Remember, this is the shallow soil. There's not much there. The seed goes down. It begins to grow immediately. And actually it rises higher than the other green sprouts around that you see as you look out over the whole farm. But the root goes down and then it hits the limestone. And there's not much moisture there. The sun comes up and it causes that tall green shoot to wither. And soon it's, there's nothing there, nothing left. It withers away. But the initial response is joy. And so what's he talking about? Well, what is this joy and what is this response and why doesn't it last? Well, Jesus talks about an emotion. The emotion is joy. And sometimes we'll see this. We'll tell the gospel to somebody and they seem so excited. You mean I can be forgiven of my sins? You mean I can go to heaven? That I can know that this is true? Wow, that's wonderful news. That's tremendous. And they may come to church and they may sing the hymns with everyone else. And then we look around, they're not there. Somebody says, well, where is so-and-so? We haven't seen him or her for a while. 
why don't they come to church anymore? And someone will call. Someone will write. Well, I'm busy. I can't be there. Yeah, yeah, I meant to come. I'll be there next week, maybe. So what's happened in that person's life? Why this joyful response? And then they're gone. Well, the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They were among us. But they went out from us so that it would be showed that they were not of us. They were never really believers. There was no true conversion. There was an emotional response. They heard the good news. Everybody wants to believe there is forgiveness of sins, to believe that they're going to heaven. But the conversion needs to be true, needs to be real. These are people of fake faith. They are pretend Christians. It's shallow soil. Never really takes root. They appear to be Christians, but then they disappear. When two things happen, the thlipsis, this, that's a Greek word for affliction, for adversity, and then persecution. So two things happen. We, <clears throat> they, they respond to the news of the gospel, the good news of the gospel, with, um, oh, this sounds good. It's self-interest. It appeals to them. I, I, can, I can get something out of this. And you say, it costs me nothing. Well, actually, it costs Jesus everything. And yeah, if you read the, the, the message of the gospel, you'll see Jesus says, take up your cross and walk. If you're going to follow me, be a disciple. You know, there are, there are going to be troubles. I remember um, a young man who, um, he heard the gospel and, uh, you know, during his, I, I knew him for, for quite a while and, and he, he kept complaining about when I heard the gospel, here was the promise. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Well, the first thing that happened was the girl I wanted to marry left me. And, you know, and it was a continual complaint. Well, he heard the part of the gospel that he wanted to hear. It is good news. But the other part is being a disciple. It cost Jesus his life. And he says, if you're going to be like me, you may have to suffer. But walk with me, because eternity is a reality, and I'm offering you heaven, the forgiveness of sins, everlasting life. And even when there are persecutions and afflictions, I'm with you. And what you're going to find out is you deepen in those times, and you're going to realize how much I love you because you're going to understand better what it cost me to save you. You're going to understand a little bit more about my sufferings as you go through those tough times. And the richness of that experience is what he promises. And so when we preach the gospel, we don't appeal to the emotions. And at growing up, I've heard a lot of invitations in different evangelical churches. And in some of those churches, when they get to the part of the gospel, the preacher changes his voice. And somebody begins to play the organ. <laughs> And people's emotions are stirred. You know the trouble with that? When people make a decision to follow Jesus based upon emotion, emotions change very quickly. It's not solid enough. You need the root to go down into the soil where it gets moisture, where it'll be furnished so the root becomes strong and the plant becomes strong. And you can... Also, manipulate not only people's emotions, but you can emo uh, manipulate their wills if they have a weak will, and a lot of people are disposed to being conned. Um, they can be convinced of something. And so we take the Word of God, we appeal to the minds of people, not just to their emotions. We don't try to twist their wills. We simply say, here is the gospel. Here's the proof that God loves you. Jesus went to the cross to die for your sins. And here's the invitation of the gospel. Trust in Jesus and you'll be forgiven of all of your sins. You'll have everlasting life. Verse 17. 
But since they have no firm root, they only last for a short time. When trouble or persecution comes before the word, because of the word, they fall away click, uh, very quickly. So they have affliction. And um, there are some good things that happen when affliction comes and when persecution comes. One thing that affliction does is if your, if your faith is fake, it will expose that. Pretend Christians don't stick around when there is affliction and when there is persecution. And that's a good thing because a person needs to understand where they are spiritually. The other thing that happens that is very good news is that for the believer, our faith is proven by affliction and by persecution. And so our faith grows stronger. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, verse 6. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith. You hear that? The proven genuineness of your faith. Is that worth very much? Paul goes on to say, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, this proven genuineness of your faith may result in what? Praise, glory, honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible joy, not the fake joy that doesn't last. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Is that encouraging? Absolutely. So when we face trials, persecution, affliction, it exposes fake faith and it assures the genuine faith of the true believer. In our prayer request this morning, I mentioned China. We have uh, Chinese people uh, here in Canada and I heard from um, one uh, uh, Chinese person today about a new emphasis on persecution um, in that Bible study groups and house churches need to register with the government. If they meet without being registered, the government can deem that their, what they're doing is illegal And they have the right to invade that home and to take away people and possessions as they wish. Just the threat of having to register is a strong intimidation of our brothers and sisters. It's tough in China, worse in North Korea and other places. But we have brothers and sisters who cannot do what we're doing this morning. But to my Chinese friends and to other believers being persecuted around the world, this parable brings a hope. Listen, you're not going to have many people of fake faith in settings like that. When people persevere through troubles and through persecution, their faith deepens because they know I will not abandon this. I have understood what is truly important to me. And nothing is more important than my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And no one can convince me that he has not risen from the dead, that the tomb is empty, that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and that he will come back. Do you know him? Do you know him? I quoted from John 6 earlier. It's a familiar passage, and a lot of people... We're leaving him. And Jesus, remember, when Jesus is alone explaining this to the disciples, the twelve, including Judas, and other disciples, he knew that some disciples would leave him. John chapter 6, this is where we see this happening. Some of the disciples, when Jesus is teaching, seemed to be becoming tougher and tougher. It wasn't as appealing as it had seemed initially. 
And Jesus turns to the twelve and he says, do you want to leave me true? Do you want to leave me too? And Simon Peter answers, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This is genuine faith. It's proved in times of trouble and in times of persecution. May God be praised as we follow the Savior who loves us so much. He laid down his life so that we can be forever with him. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this powerful message that you give us. Thank you that you prepare the soil, the hearts of the hearers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.